all so much for being here. We're going to kick our program off again. My name is Kristen Campbell. I am Chief Program Officer at the National Conference on Citizenship, NCOC, and I'm here to talk to you about the Civic Data Challenge. Um, just a brief bit of background, NCOC is a national nonprofit, and we are focused on using civic data to understand the civic strengths and challenges of our communities. We really see data as a tool to unlock a community's greatest assets so that that community can solve its own social problems. One of our newest programs is called the Civic Data Challenge, and that's what we're all here to talk to you about today. In 2012, NCOC partnered with the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation to launch the first ever Civic Data Challenge. It was our effort to bring new eyes, minds, skills, and thinking to the field of civic data and civic health. We learned lots of new and interesting things about how civic engagement connects to things like the arts and the humanities and public safety and education in communities, as well as um, the economic factors that civic engagement can influence as well. And what the challenge did is we saw the creation of new apps and tools and infographics that could help people take action on some of those issues in their communities. The challenge really for us was our effort to democratize the research process and put people in charge of their own data analysis and, and unlocking some of those tools. And what we also wanted to do is we wanted to break down silos of people. Um, we wanted to bring together people who really care about good data and good evaluation and good metrics and pair them together with people who care about good communities and good social services and things like that. We recognize that those are not mutually exclusive groups, but that sometimes we all are guilty of operating kind of in our own silos and, and this was really our effort to bring people together and break down some of those silos for more collaborative um, research and decision-making processes. So this year, when we were launching the second iteration of the Civic Data Challenge, we wanted to take this process a little one step further. So what we did is we took um, all of our lessons learned and our analysis from the first year of the challenge, and we built an improved, we think it's improved, um, maybe they'll, they'll tell you that as well, I hope, um, improved and expanded version of the challenge, where instead of just really thinking about what tools are coming out of this, we wanted to think about what actions could come out of it as well. So now the finalists in the Civic Data Challenge who have created these tools and these apps and these infographics are working with community partner institutions, with nonprofits or local governments or small businesses to pilot those uh, tools and those products and really see, make sure that they meet a community need or, and, and help the organization and have a really direct impact on public decision making process. We, through the challenge this year, we had a public brainstorm and we had brought advisors together who could really help the, th the teams think about how they could refine their projects um, and then, again, partnered with the, the community organizations to actually implement those. So today, one of the purposes for my being here is to talk to you about the seven finalists that have been selected to go on to this implementation phase in this year's Civic Data Challenge. I'm going to talk to you about five, and then there are two that are here that are going to talk to you and um, tell you about their, their projects as well. So um, first, I'm going to tell you about the five, and they are in no particular order, Anytown USA, which is a tool that empowers local leaders to collaborate. Their website contains a report card on the 51 largest metropolitan areas and where they stand in their civic engagement and their civic health. It also maps the civic, the civic leadership of that community alongside that report card and those indicators so that people can get a really comprehensive picture of what's going on there. And then it takes that information and pairs it with a how-to guide for people who want to bring this assessment to their own neighborhoods. There's also a group called CVAC, and what they have done is they've worked with a community partner in Rochester, New York, to understand the challenges that that organization has in recruiting and retaining volunteers that help achieve their mission. So they've taken national volunteer data and analyzed it and then put kind of a hyper-local lens on it, working in partnership with this organization to develop a mobile tool, a mobile application, to help that organization better recruit, train, and manage their volunteers. 
there's a group called the DC Resource Community Directory Project, which helps residents find health and social services information in the DC area. It, uh, it also takes community resource data and establishes it in the public commons in order that uh, stakeholders and local managers can think how that contributes to an ecosystem of applications and users and it's more accessible to people uh, across the community. The Civic Data Denver team has developed a civic health infographic that, that aims to really help people think about how does their civic health relate to their personal health. And when we say civic health, I probably should have said this from the beginning, when we say civic health, what we're really thinking about is the overall community vitality of a community. Kind of thinking about it as like civic stocks. What are the rates at which people are voting, volunteering, engaging with their neighbors? What kind of social trust exists in that community? How are people interacting with their institutions? And also, what motivates people to become involved? Um, so that's really what I mean when I say civic health. I'm sorry I didn't start with that at the outset. Um, but the Civic Health Data Denver team aims to think about how do we take our physical health and our civic health and pair them together to understand the comprehensive picture of what our community looks like. Um, by creating this infographic, they hope that the findings will help um, lead to a creation of a social equity toolkit as well as a service learning curriculum that can be implemented in schools and community groups uh, citywide. And then the last one I'm going to tell you about is called the Texas Connector, which is a project that comes out of the One Star Foundation. And what they've done is they've taken all the civic data of, their, of Texas, as well as the social services information from Texas, and they've put it on a map. So they've been able to overlay it on a map so you can see those things together and identify how people can best target resources to the underserved communities um, and where also some of their, their strengths are as well. Um, the hope of that is that they will then be able to more accurately assess community needs and develop tools, policy, and resources that can respond specifically to those needs. So those are the five of the seven finalists that I would like to talk to you about, but now I'm gonna turn it over to two of our teams, two other finalists, who are gonna tell you about their own projects. The first is called the Manifesto Project, and it is represented here today by Michael Tyra and Maura Whiteman. And then the second one is called Outline.com, and it's represented from a gentleman here from the Bay Area um, named Nikita Beer. So, gentlemen. All right. Uh, my name is Mara Whiteman. I'm founder of the Manifesto Project, and this is Michael Tyra. Uh, and he is one of our leaders and the strategic coordinator <laughs> uh, for the project. So... The Manifesto Project was sparked by a report released by NCOC and a think tank in Arizona called the Center for the Future of Arizona. And within this, uh, this report called the Arizona We Want 2.0, it outlined some civic health indicators for young Arizonans, uh, people in the 18 to 29 age range. And things were pretty dismal. Uh, and a lot of young leaders in the state, uh, we started taking a look at this data and we were saying, you know, how can we get our young leaders more engaged in their communities? How can we get them uh, active and how do we get them a voice in the policies that are going to make a difference for the state of Arizona going into the future? Uh, because as a state, we have a, a very large baby boomer population, uh, the snowbirds who have come down to Arizona, and when they retire, uh, our economy is going to need young blood in it that's going to you know, keep it going into the future. So we were, we were talking and we were saying, how do, we, how do we get Arizonans, young Arizonans, to stay in this state and how do we get them engaged? And so the first thing we thought of is there is no place where you can look in Arizona and say, this is what young people want for the state. And so we said, what if we had 50 events across the state in urban areas, rural areas, across all demographics, uh, specifically bringing in young people and asking them three simple questions. Our generation is, so how do we define ourselves? I would stay in Arizona forever if, what is our dream for this state? And I will lead the change I want to see by, how are they gonna be active in making a difference in their communities? So we began this project the Manifesto Project, where young leaders are coming together to basically espouse a set of goals for the state of Arizona. 
their manifestos, and eventually we're going to aggregate these 50, uh, these 50 events data, 750 data points from these events across the state into one large manifesto for the state of Arizona that basically captures the voice of young Arizonans. Now we were looking at this and we were saying this is going to be a lot of fanfare, this is going to show off basically what young leaders want, but that's not quite enough. How do we implement something that's going to create lasting change for the state? And that's where I'm going to hand it off to Michael and he can talk a bit about our implementation phase. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Michael Tyra. I am Chief Strategist for the Manifesto Project. And like Morrow mentioned, our philosophy really is and has been from the beginning that all of this data is fantastic and the fact that we're able to collect it is amazing. But without definable, measurable action steps to back it up and to create actual measurable change in our state, it's useless. I mean, that's just how it is. So phase two of the Manifesto Project is really where things get exciting. Um, now that we have all of this great data, we want to use it. We want to leverage it using our community partners, our board of advisors, and a series of what we call advocates who are professionals, um, sector-specific experts in their fields who are working to uh, help us recruit and solicit and engage organizations to really um, bring on board young leaders in those fields, the ones that we have already identified who have expressed interests and passion in those sectors. We want to get them in the door, into positions on boards, in shadow board positions, in internships and executive level positions where they can be mentored, where they can be developed, so that as we go forward towards this generational shift that is fast approaching, we have all of these young leaders being groomed and developed for leadership positions that will help keep Arizona competitive in the years to come. We've experienced a large number of success already with a number of different organizations extremely excited to get us, on, to get us involved and on board. And we're anticipating over the next six months to a year that we're going to experience even more success in these areas. So thank you so much, and we're honored to be here. So oftentimes when a new medium comes out, we tend to use it in the way that we use the previous medium, not realizing what's possible. For example, some of the first television broadcasts were people simply talking on the radio. So I'm Nikita Beer, and I founded Outline.com to bring government into the 21st century. Um, and we think we're seeing something very similar happening with government. What we build is public policy simulators. You could think of it sort of as SimCity, but for real life. For centuries, we've been creating and communicating government policies through unstructured text documents like these. And the online versions, well, they haven't really improved how this knowledge is conveyed. In a world where everything is intelligent, government interactions still look the same way they have for 250 years. Because of this, most of us just don't have the patience to engage. But it does matter. New government policies change each of our incomes about $4,000 each year. Until today, these changes have been barely understood and only loosely influenced by the public. So at Outline, what we're doing is we're making engagement with government and representation in government direct, easy, or intelligent, and easy. Uh, over the last year, with a team of economists from the Council of Economic Advisors, and uh, data scientists and Silicon Valley product designers, we've been developing a model of the U.S. economy where anyone can configure government policies and then see their projected impacts on real people. It's backed by millions of tax returns and census records. So to show you how it works, uh, we're going to simulate a policy scenario uh, for my friend Rudy. And this is a policy that he knows nothing about. So Rudy would come to outline.com and this is, a, this is a state proposal, so he would enter in his information. So he's married, he drives, uh, he has two kids, and he makes about $45,000 a year with $1,000 or $800 in capital gains. Then you'd see all the policies itemized in terms of taxes and benefits. Um, and you'd see he stands to gain around $227 from this particular scenario. But Rudy isn't totally self-absorbed. He also cares how it'll impact his community. So what he can do is he can click map in the top left corner. And what this does is it pulls up a simulation of this policy scenario against every single tax return in the state. Uh, and you can see that the red areas are harmed and the green areas are benefited uh, at a per capita level. Um, so this is in Massachusetts. Um, so we can hover over zip codes. And in Cambridge is where he lives. And you'll see that most people are better off. 
Um, so knowing this information isn't enough, Rudy should be able to actually increase the probability of it happening. So he can click endorse in the top right corner and his response gets recorded on the government's analytics, helping them shape policies around what people want. So what we've done at Outline is we've made representation in government something that can be part of everyone's daily internet experience. What we call it is aided representation, where we find out how policies impact your interests and help you advance those interests. But Outline isn't just about showing what government does or what government has planned, it's also about pushing the boundaries of what government can do. So let's say Rudy thinks he pays too much in sales tax, so we could actually simulate that against the spending patterns of every single resident in the state, just by moving a slider and then clicking calculate impacts in the bottom corner, or at the bottom of the page. It'll calculate it against every single person, you'll see the map updates to green, uh, and you'll also see we did bankrupt the state in the right corner. <laughs> uh, but let's, let's try something else, bear with me. We're gonna see how it impacts different income levels from poor to rich. Um, so let's imagine uh, we want to spend more on higher education because college is too expensive. So we're gonna go into the education tab and we're gonna move this slider over. And some of this money is gonna get allocated toward the financial aid packages of uh, households with students. We'll hit calculate impacts. It'll calculate it against every person in the state. And you'll see that middle class households were the primary beneficiaries of that change. So the idea here is that whatever vision you have for government, you can create it in outline. And your analysis would be as sophisticated as that of an economist. Um, now I'm sure it seems very novel and most new technologies do. Uh, but last year our team built this sort of product and it worked. You may have used it, uh, it was called Politify, and you could enter in your information and see how the Obama and Romney plans would impact your bottom line. In just 90 days, it was used by over four million people, and we did a controlled study and 6% of people changed their political affiliation within four minutes of visiting the site. It was maybe one of the most influential pieces of political content in Western civilization. <laughs> uh, so that's outline.com. You can sign up for the private beta uh, on our site. We're, uh, we're doing that now. Uh, and we'll, we're launching in Massachusetts uh, next year, uh, in probably in around January. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys, for telling us about your projects. Um, these two, again, represent two of our finalists in this year's Civic Data Challenge, as well as the five that I discussed before. If you visit our website, is civicdatachallenge.org, you can learn more about all seven of the finalists, find links to their projects, learn how you can get involved. Um, we'll also be here throughout the day today, so we'd love to connect with anybody who wants to learn more. Also, if you are interested in helping us think about what the next iteration of this challenge could look like, um, I would welcome a conversation with you as well. Um, in terms of this year's challenge, these folks are, and our other five finalists are all piloting their tools right now in partnerships with the community institutions, and we will announce our final winners and the prizes associated for those winners this November. So again, please join us at civicdatachallenge.org, find out how you can become involved, um, and we'd all love to chat with you as well. So thanks for being here today, guys. We appreciate you having us. And thanks to Data Week for their partnership on this challenge.